So we're going to get going. This is the Octo Project Birds of a Feather uh, question and answer gathering. Um, the way that these typically work is that uh, we don't really have a presentation. What we do have is a whole row of, uh, of Yocto Project core maintainers sitting up here in the front. Um, please keep your tomatoes to yourself. No rotten fruit, no nothing like that. Uh, but what we, what we do want to do is hear your questions and to find out what it is that is important for you to ask about. And if nobody has any immediate questions, we can talk about the release that just happened. And, uh, and maybe talk about some of the interesting things going on in the project. So to start out, does anybody have any burning questions that they're working on? And they can be dumb, easy questions. They can be even complex questions. Let me run the mic over to you, just because we're, I, re I record these so that we can. We did follow up from last year's US session okay. with GPL v2. Basically, now that we have a separate layer, are you continue to apply security patch, vulnerability patch? to the GPL v2, or are you planning to rely on people doing it and pushing it upstream? Okay. Good question. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, so Mana GPL v2 is, is a problem, particularly because if somebody's been working on the, the more recent version of the code, there are certain licensing questions which come into play as to whether they can even apply patches to the older one. So I. I really think that people are going to have to find a different way of, of do it, dealing with things than trying to apply security fixes to software that's getting ever older. So I separated that stuff out in the first place because we, we needed to, to highlight there's a problem there. And there, there is a big problem to do with you know contamination and licensing and that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I would not rely on Meta GPLv2 uh, as a long-term solution. I mean, if people send patches and things and they, they've, they've gone through the right process with licenses to be able to apply patches to it, great. But I, I, I personally can't see it and I personally don't want to invest time in that. Richard Purdy is the chief architect for the project, by the way. We'll probably introduce people as they, as they talk. There was another question back here. Mr. Mark. So uh, since we have like a preempt RT support in uh, OE, will we get Xenomai support as well? Do we understand the question? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, if we have, since we have a preempt RT support in the core, uh, will we ever get Xenomai support as well? I mean, there were patches posted, but. Uh, the answer was they have to go through the steering committee or something, and there was no answer after that. So Xenomai is the question. Anybody? I don't know the answer. <laughs> I, I can give an answer. Um, it's a good question, and the, the reason we have the preempt T stuff in there was because there was somebody willing to step up and maintain it, and it has been well maintained for a quite a long period of time, you know, particularly by Bruce Ashfield. Um, with with Zanamai, I think if if somebody does want to step up and is willing to maintain it and put the effort into that, that's that's good. It does have implications for the testing matrix, and that's another one of my concerns. We don't test the RT stuff particularly heavily, but I'm I'm okay with that because I know Bruce does. Um, if, so it's partly a question of, okay, what's the proposal and who would actually be testing it as well? So if it's, yeah. A, a t things have changed and layers are a lot more maintainable and can handle this stuff a lot better than they used to be able to. So I'm also tending to push things like that to layers where they make sense rather than the core. So th there's a high bar to entry. I'm not saying no, but there needs to be a good case for it. And other people need to turn around and say, yes, I find this interesting as well. Okay. That answers your question. Uh, so I'm Tim Morling. I just spent the last year working on the real-time Linux project, and so I did a lot of testing of the preempt RT stuff because of that. Um, but Xenomai was not on our radar. Um, but I know that, for instance, Siemens is looking into it and things like that. So there are other people using it, but Siemens does not ne does not necessarily traditionally use Yocto project. Um, so we need to find, you know, the group of people who are interested in it who are going to step up bring it in and maintain it. Um, and then, we, then we'll see whether it is appropriate for core or not. Um, we're really, really trying to keep core slim um, in part because we have some legal and licensing things that we're attempting to do to make it much, much easier for, for people to use. Um, 
I can't say a whole lot more than that about it right now, but um, so uh, I would suggest as Richard is kind of indicating, you know, what that should go to a, you know, a metazenomide, you know, layer or something like that perhaps, or, or uh, wherever, meta virtualization or someplace where it makes sense. I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, once you've have, you have like a custom kernel repo, uh, it's stable. What are the next steps to have a BSP layer uh, written uh, on top of this uh, kernel repo? Okay. Sounds like a good question. Okay, so I just, uh, there's a, the EAL sessions going on. I just created a distro layer and a BSP layer as an example and wrote up a lab manual for that. So, um, and I did a, uh, I used, so if you look in, um, in OE core, there's a metaskeleton layer and in that there is a Linux custom recipe. Um, and so that's one place where you can do the traditional approach where it's a git repo and a def config, right? So not, so the Yocto project traditional approach to, um, you know, within Linux Yocto is we use uh, config fragments. And even those, have, those, even though those have been supported in mainline uh, Linux for, since 2011, um, that's not most people's traditional approach to it. But, so the next step is you actually wanna create, uh, or you might want to create a machine or append a machine, you know, override a machine, something like that, to include that kernel. Um, so if, if you look on GitHub at the EAL, uh, um, yeah. so, so there's, there's several approaches you can take there. So basically you need to get that, that kernel recipe into a layer somehow so that's being picked up by BitBake and you can actually just give it a unique name and then have uh, in your local.conf or if you have a distro layer in your distro.conf, you can add um, the virtual kernel pointing to that specific recipe name. There's, there's a whole lot of other ways to it, but that's kind of the, the basic approach should be uh, really, the, you would put that into your own BSP layer, even though that might be the only thing there. Yep. Yes, yeah, so, so basically you, the, the, that's why there's layers. So you want to be creating, in this situation, you want to be creating a BSP layer. It's, I would highly suggest you probably also want to be creating a distro layer because you probably are doing a product. You probably want branding, and that's where that should go. Um, the machine type stuff is where the Linux kernel could, could be defined, and that should be in a BSP layer. There are times when it could be appropriate in a distro layer. Just it, that's a little bit gray area. But in general, the the, the Linux um, res, Linux kernel recipes should be in your BSP layer along with your drivers. And if you're doing device tree or whatever else you're doing, U boot, those kind of things could all be there. Um, bootloader, whatever it is. So that that all be, belongs in the BSP type layer. Um, and again, I just if you look at GitHub at e al e dash al, there's a um, uh, there's a lab that I just did. I, I created all these, all the metadata. I wrote up the lab for it. Um, yeah, and there's other places, but that I, I just finished that last last week. So, okay. thank you. Uh, any other questions going on? Yes. Hi, I'm I'm new to Yocto. Um, I have a, a question. Uh, is does Yocto support um, had Docker files for uh, new users to uh, set up quickly? Another one for Tim. Thank you all for asking questions about all the stuff that I have been working on. Okay, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so um, last year I was working on the crops team, which was addressing Docker usage in um, to enable Docker. To help, to help us in Yocto project and so on. So uh, in the in core, we actually added um, the ability to, to create kernel or container recipes. So if you're talking about actually running 
Docker creating Docker containers in Yocto, if that's what you mean. Yes, so the meta virtualization layer has, um, has recipes for Docker. Core has uh, the ability to create container images that's not necessarily limited to Docker. It could be uh, any of the other uh, container types that are out there. Essentially what it does is it uses um, Linux dummy so that it doesn't have a kernel um, because most of these kernels, most of these containers do not have kernels in them. There are exceptions to that, like clear Linux or clear containers, but um, and so yeah, so the, it is definitely in there, it's doable. Um, I'm not personally really up to date on what's going on there, but I know that um, there's been activity in various places, including inside Wind River, that uh, have been, been t leveraging that. Does that answer your question? Good. Yes. So what what's the um, what's the vision for Yocto, say, and, and, and OE for two to five years from now? What what are we gonna? What will it be? How how is it going to evolve in the next two to five years? Flying cars, things like that. Do you want to tackle that one? <laughs> I don't know if you want me to. I'll talk about flying cars and stuff. No, I, I, I think that um, short term, there's some definite short term problems with the project, or not problems, but challenges, such as the maintainership and how we keep all the recipes up to date, how we extend some of the automated testing, and how that applies into other layers within the ecosystem. Because I think Open Embedded Core has kind of been leading the way, but we need to take some of the things we've been doing there. And, and roll them out. So certainly those are the sort of the, the immediate things that I've, I've been worrying about. And um, go, going back five years, I think we did have a good idea of the particular feature sets and so on that we need to do, such as recipe specific sysroots, such as multi-lib support. I think that, um, and, and so, so there's definitely gaps in the project. I think some of the cloud pieces, such as the Docker containers, Tim's just talked about crops. There are definitely areas where we've still got work to do. Um, but I'm at the point where I'm just trying to think, take a step back and think, okay, you know, we know what we need to do short term. I think the long term vision is, is currently just being rethought about. So, yeah, that's my take. And I think that we're probably safe to say that we're welcome to uh, community input on that. Uh, are, there, are there specific issues that you would want to address or that you would want the, the project to, to cover? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I don't know if, uh, I'll ask Tim a meta question. Do you want me to bring up my, my question that we discussed? So, I mean, one, one just, this is a, almost a short-term thing, but it, it evolves into a long-term thing. Can, can we get the, the project to align on the long-term support kernels, for example? We seem to be missing by a, a version or two, and I know in, in my project, Automotive Grade Linux now, we're being we're going to take Rocco and and forward port to uh, 4.14 in order to take advantage of of long term support. Um, but so how do we how do we for example here's the the question I posed um, the question I posited last night which is how do I take Greg's new release of the of a long of 4.14 for example and get that upstream to OE and 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 Pocky and then into my project in throwing out a time frame, two weeks. Two weeks. Do you want to answer that one, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> just a little explosion from the peanut gallery back there. Sorry. I'm just throwing out a time frame. What is the appropriate time frame? What is the appropriate time frame? So, so specifically on, the, on the, um, the LTS kernels, we do have an LTS kernel in each of the in every of the each of the releases, but you'll find that for Rocco it wasn't four. I don't think it's four fourteen because four fourteen hadn't shipped at the time. Yeah, right. So I think it's four nine is, is what people are saying here. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. But the the point is that if we have a, a particular the LTS version that we've had in that release, we'll continue to roll with that release and roll with the updates for that release. What we won't do is take a completely new of kernel version and pull that back into one of the older releases. So you're you're seeing things like GCC updates. I mean, you mentioned a release that's just come out. That's actually the two four two point release, and that has um, GCC six. Uh, well, sorry, GCC seven up upgrades in it. And we did upgrade GCC 7 from 7.2, I think, to 7.3, uh, 
yeah. Anyway, we upgrade GCC, and when we say upgrade, it's down a stable branch of GCC. So those are just bug fixes and security fixes and those kind of things. They're not, not feature changes. So we do something similar to the kernel. A kernel version you know, would have the point numbers for the same reason. But we wouldn't go and backport 414 into, into Rocco. That's something that somebody can do, like AGL, if you've got specific use cases. But it's not something that we would do within our current stable framework with the project. So um, I can add it to, so there's uh, the testing framework, which is actually making your life easier if you're doing that on your own. So hopefully you will be able to take that, uh, I believe, and you know validate your kernel against the test metadata or the, all the test infrastructure that's currently very good in shape, actually. That should help you kind of accelerate your validation. Just as an example, op so the newer kernel versions require OpenSSL as a dependency during um, build time now. And if we tried backporting that, that will then break a load of stuff in Rocco and we then have to go and fix it. Um, right. and, and so that these things do bring in changes that cause problems. And that said, I think you, the, the way the metadata is structured, you can pull pieces and backport them comparatively easily. So we have our policy for core, but it, it should be straightforward into like AGL. Yeah, I think the really the the key is to keep the communication going between the projects. What I'm hearing from the front vendors is they're aligning on Rocco as opposed to GCC. Okay. I don't. So that's that. So I understand that people want something that's stable, right? So they're picking Rocco because it's got a couple of point releases. So that absolutely makes sense. But again, we're in a, a pickle because. As they just said, there's you know there's a lot of things that are going to break when you, up, uh, especially as big of a jump as 414 just happened to be, um, and when GCC changes have to come in, glibc changes have to come in, and everything. So all of those things, unfortunately, they come in so early in the dependency tree that, that they're, they're basically the first things that come in, and so everything else afterwards um, was dependent upon that, and so. Um, this is why I try to nudge people to be on the latest release, which is, you know, Sumo is going to be coming out. We had a long discussion about that last night, but I'm just trying to, you know, in general, I would, have, would be suggesting to people, if you want the latest LTS, that, and that is 4.14, that we're on 4.14.24 right now on master, which is frozen, feature frozen now, which will be released in, some time from now. Uh, officially, it was supposed to be April 24th, but I, I don't really know where we're at. Um, I don't know if any of us are 100% sure where we're at right at this moment, but yeah. If you were me, and, and you were planning a release in July, or June or July, I can't take the risk of moving to Sumo between now you the other thing I just want to I, I also wanted to ask about was QA there seems to be a, a things are slowing down in QA like the 2.3.3 has taken forever to get out of QA so one of the things that's going on there the reality is that um, QA just moved from Guadalajara to Penang um, so there are there are realities that happen so that is one issue the other issue is that we've had some very, very difficult to fix changes um, that came up in this, this release cycle. That's actually happened the last couple of release cycles. Um, and we are a fairly small number of people. The actual people doing this work is, it, you, you'd probably be shocked because it's certainly less than the number of people in this room. And the amount of work we do is, is staggering. So, um, Anyway, so there's just some realities there. Uh, my pat answer to you, and I know this is not the answer to you specifically, but in general, this is why there's OSVs. So this is why we have Monte Vista and Wind River and Mentor Graphics and people like that. When you need, specifically you want that kernel support, you can get it from those OSVs. The other thing is we have some very, very capable consultants like Consolco and Bootlin and others that can also do this for you. So, yeah, Chris. So, uh, just following up on that, on that, that kernel questioning, um, I. Is it, 
Okay. Um, so I don't have a horse in this race, so I'm asking purely out of curiosity, fed by the, the original question. So if, if you guys, uh, the project doesn't want to support a, a newer kernel in a shipped release branch, but you have members of the uh, community downstream who are doing that work, well, what would your guidance be to, if, if there are multiple parties who want to use, say, 414, uh, and those guys should be sharing resources and collaborating. What, what guidance would you give them to be able to um, exchange and work together? Good I, I think that people need to get together and collaborate on that stuff. So part of it is figuring out, okay, who has this problem? Can we share that code and what have you? And then, yeah, f you know, find a place on, I don't know, Pocky Contrib or, or wherever it makes sense to, to actually share that work, show it to others. And then, yeah, I mean, we, we've, the, the Octo project's been doing its stable releases and we have sort of like a rough two year time frame for that, after which, you know, think we don't really go beyond that. But we have been asked, well, okay, what would people do if they have patches for older releases? And the answer there is that we'd, we're willing to create branches, but we need to differentiate them from the core process so people know there's a step sort of function in quality, you know, that they're not running the same tests and so on. So, yeah, it's something that we're figuring out, but definitely get people to collaborate, share branches, and yeah. So this, my goal for this year is actually to do a whole lot more with runtime testing um, instead of preaching about it, I'm actually going to just make it happen. Um, and that's one of the things that would be necessary here because in order to drop the quality um, validation cycles, we need to have more automation instead of having it be um, done you know, in, in any kind of manual or it, you reserve the manual stuff for what it, what it should be. So that's, that's just kind of another issue that's, it's, that's been waiting for a long time um, and that's something that, that's a goal of mine to address this year. In the, in the case of a kernel update, because um, I, I maintain the meta open embedded, and um, oh, great. Um, so I, like when uh, core updated their kernel, it affected meta open embedded, and we had to update all the packages. So that's probably what you're going to see start seeing happen. If you bring in a really uh, like a 214, 215, 216, you'll start breaking other layers that you have, you're then going to have to go fix. Because um, that's what I'm seeing with mid open embedded, you know, the same thing with the tool chain when we do that It just ripples through all the layers, you know Do you have any plans to add a u-boot menu config we see a lot of uh, k configs in u-boot and I see a lot of customers asking for u-boot menu configs and one of the like few customers I see, they ask for like adding packages uh, like rootfs menu configs also. Uh, they see like searching a lot of dependency packages. They are not Yocto service, but they need some of the packages, like similar to older uh, Freescale LTIP kind of menu config to add, select the packages. That will be a good roadmap. Yeah. Okay, so so creating, I mean, effectively, what we're asking for is a GUI around package sort of, sort of, or you know, selection for things and images. We have tried this several times. So there was originally Hob, and then we, uh, which was a graphical user interface that allowed you to do things like that. And then Toaster was another set of developments in that direction. It never, I don't think it quite got to the point where you could do that, but it was, it, it, the idea was that 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 would be somewhere where that functionality could go. Um, Menu config is, is great up to a point, but with something as complex as we've got, it doesn't really scale to that. Certainly not to show you the information that you would need to make decisions. Um, toaster was, would, would be able to cover it, but we can't, we're struggling to get people to work on Toaster. So yes, I love the idea and I'd love to have it, but somebody's gonna have to step up and, and make that happen. And so far, don't, that doesn't seem to be the, the people stepping up to do it. It really speaks to the, uh, the quality of the project as a community project. So, other questions? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe um, talk about the, the testing that you guys are doing. Um, 
you know, how, I guess, what, what kind of tests are you running? How could I um, possibly replicate the same tests with my system? Um, and if the answer is, you know, go read this document, that's great too. It, it, it's worth giving a quick summary of it now because I think it's probably interesting to a number of people in this room. And I think it's something that we don't promote enough because a lot of people don't realize it's there. So we've got multiple different levels of tests. Um, there is a, um, so, one of them is image testing. So when the system builds an image, it's good to figure out, okay, does this image boot? What, you know, does, does the functionality in that image work? So that's what the um, test image code does. So there's actually a test image class. And when you inherit, the, I think if you inherit test image, you then get a test image task. And then that can be run automatically after a root FS is generated where it could boot it up in Kemu and then run the tests against it. Um, there is some hooks in there which would allow you to interface that to a real piece of hardware as well. So it's not just limited to virtualized stuff, but we don't tend to use that so much. We, we use that, but we use that on all our infrastructure to boot up and then runtime test all of the images that we generate where we can run them under Kemu, and that's pretty much everything. So when the auto build, so we have an auto builder, um, auto builder at yoctoproject.org that's um, running all of these builds. Um, usually we're now pre-testing things before they go into master. That's building across all of the Kemu machines. So that's four architectures across 32 and 64 bit, across two different distros, Pocky and Pocky LSP, along with a whole load of other configurations. And that will build the images and then actually run them under test image. That has some other um, sort of partners in crime, so to speak, um, such as test SDK and test the extensible SDK. So there's some other tasks that correspond to testing those artifacts. And then if you've got um, test cases that are more higher level sort of workflow type um, tests, then we have OE self test, which is a huge collection of tests for things like dev tool, recipe tool, and um, workflow type sort of situations where you'd want to build something, uh, you know, change something and then check that something rebuilt or those, those kind of workflow sort of tests. Um, and there's also P test. P test are where um, specific pieces of software have test suites with them. So you might run make check and it would run through and run a set of tests. Those, we, cap we capture them up into p-test packages, which you can install into the images and then run the tests there to get, to get those results. So there's an awful lot of testing that, that you can do. And we, we, run, we run OE self-test, we run the test image, the test SDK and so on. p-test, we do run more as part of the manual QA process right now but we're looking at automating that and then automating collecting up the results. So, uh, um, yeah, and there's also a bit big self-test. So there are unit tests on specific parts of the project as well. So, so p-test um, is, that's when I say runtime testing, I'm talking about that. So the p and p-test is for package, so package test. So that's for individual packages that you've, that you've installed into your image and um, so I'm the, the co-maintainer of MetaPython and MetaPerl, um, and also you know, some of the other Meta Open Embedded layers. Um, I've been around Open Embedded for 10 years now. So um, just so happened that the last year that I spent with the real-time team, I ended up doing a lot of hardware testing. And so I actually did the testing with Lava as the, the hardware framework. Um, so I'm actually giving a talk tomorrow about that. Um, so I just introduced into core a, um, a new class, so it's ptest-perl, which makes it very, very easy to have Perl modules run their tests, and that, that was easy to do because Perl's got very consistent uh, testing for individual things. Uh, my next target's gonna be Python, and then we'll keep going from there. But one of the problems we have is that as people are introducing new recipes, especially to MetaOpen Embedded, but you know, also to core, um, we don't actually have complete coverage of p-test. So even though whatever that was, you know, that you're, you're introducing had unit tests that could be run, nobody bothered or, you know, took the time, the extra time, or, or even knew it was there to do the, to actually create the p-test thing. So just very briefly, what p-test does is it runs a script that's, that you have to provide that's called run p-test. And that's basically just a bash shell, which might just be as simple as calling make check which obviously you have to depend on make and things like that. Um, or it calls something else. So it could call talks for Python or whatever. Um, so it's really not that difficult to do, but you do kind of you know, need to wrap your head around it. 
Um, I think we've realized that that is a particular point that needs to be uh, needs to be documented. So that's my plan for the next couple of weeks is actually to capture some of the things that I've just done very very recently uh, in order to share that experience with other people and try to get more community help um, with that. Great. Any other burning questions? Uh, one thing, going back to uh, what's going on new with the project, one thing that I can say is that we've been doing a whole lot of documentation work, and we happen to have our documenter, documenters here. So if you have any specific burning issues with the documentation or requests and would like to talk about them, this, is a great, this conference is a great time to do that. Uh, also, the, there is a new Yocto Project website that uh, just launched last week. And uh, we're anxious to hear feedback on it, so if you would like to come and talk to us at the booth, we would be very grateful if you'd take a look at it. And I don't know how we're doing on time, but I think we're getting down towards the end. Uh, Dev Day, that's a good thing to bring up, isn't it? Uh, Thursday, we are running, I think it is the, the ninth or the 10th Dev Day. It's a developer day. It'll be uh, off-site, we'll provide, docu or provide uh, transportation for it. Uh, it's a paid event, and what it is is a, a day-long training that you will spend with the folks sitting here in, the, in this room uh, working on the Octo Project. There is a beginner section, that we're, a beginner track that will take you from you know, 0 to 60 very quickly, and an advanced track where we cover a lot of the advanced topics that we've been talking about here in this BOF and more. So uh, if you have any interest in that, uh, come and talk to me. I'm sure we can, we can figure out a way to get you there. So any other questions? Oh, yes, one more question here in the back. Our our package management is ported to DNF. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is from Fujitsu. I think you'd plug. Where would we plug in for a demo? Up here in front. Fujitsu is a long time. Sorry, long time contributor to the uh, to the project. Just audio. Sorry, did you is there a VGA connection up here? This looks like VGA. Is that blue and yellow? That one looks like it's very short. I'll try this one. Something's happening. Can you see anything? Does anybody have any further questions? Yes, David. Say that one more time. Oh, the raffle. Yes, at the booth we have a couple of copies of Rudy Strife's excellent book on the Octo Project. We're we'll raffling one off today, one at the booth crawl, and one tomorrow. So stop by and get a raffle ticket. So I have a question, uh, sort of related to a question asked earlier about Docker. Is it possible to have a base Docker image that does run Yocto? I'm not quite sure what that would mean, considering you don't really have a package manager in Yocto, but it still could potentially be useful. Also, if you have recommendations on just uh, what training courses would be best for Yocto, that would also be really useful. I might be able to answer the basics on that one, but uh, do you guys want to want to take that one? Okay. Okay. So. Um, 
Uh, the question was, is it possible to have a base Docker image that is running the Octo? And by, by that, I think what you mean is a, a running Linux that was created with the Octo project. Um, that's certainly possible. I mean, people run uh, Linux in, in containers very easily. Uh, we do not have a, we were talking about a package management, and that might be a, a more interesting question about uh, package, package upgrades, you mean, and updates? My thought there was typically with Docker, you have your Docker file and you're using apt or whatever other package manager within your Docker file to be like, include all this stuff in there. With Yocto, I mean, obviously a system isn't built that way, so I'm not really sure like how you would make a base image usable, like how would you get everything you needed into there? I guess you could copy pre-compiled binaries into it from like the system you're building the Docker from. Uh, so I just wonder if anyone has done that or what the thoughts on that were. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to remember if, we, if we've done exactly what you're saying, but it's certainly possible to take one of the um, published artifacts that would be in a core image minimal, core image sato, and actually create a, a Docker container out of that. I don't remember for a fact if we've done that or not. Um, so there are, are on uh, GitHub slash crops, there are containers to run the tool chain. So there's a Pocky container that'll run the Pocky, um, you know, Bitbake and all those things for you, but that's a different, that's not what you're talking about. Um, but we, again, what I said earlier, we do have the container uh, images or image class uh, capable of generating an image from Yocto, uh, from a Yocto-based build system or open embedded based build system. Um, so the second part of your question was about package uh, management. So we actually are package management sort of agnostic because we actually support uh, Debian packaging, RPM packaging, and um, O package. So there is indeed package management there. The part that most people who are used to traditional distri distributions don't quite get is where you're building your own distribution. So your distribution that you are building, as we were talking about earlier, or alluding to earlier, is based on a particular kernel, a particular GCC version, a particular glibc version, or muscle, or whatever you're using, right? But all of these things are really, really super important to whether those binaries that you've created in your package feed are going to work or not. So um, there's also an issue of, anybody actually producing binary packages for public consumption because you are now signing on to, to a different kind of legal implication than you were um, when you're just providing the source code in order to build that. And so this is sort of a, an issue that, um, that the Yocta project itself would have. We don't really have an easy path to providing a package feed that you could then go and point to, but we can, we have, uh, I think it's in Tips and Tricks. Uh, there's a, a thing that talks about package feeds and how to, how to actually generate your own. It's, qu it's actually quite simple to do that. Um, and then you could use that in, in Docker. To, so if, say, inside your company or inside your entity, you could create your own package feed. You know, everybody's on the same version of the kernel and GCC and everything, so none of those things are going to break. And then they can uh, use their own use that package feed either to update their own images or a VM or Docker container or whatever. So that's definitely possible. Um, uh, I, I, I don't think, I just don't think we've gone all the way there. I mean, we, of course we intended to. I just don't think we've gone all the way to exactly the model you're talking about. Um, I would also say that most likely, uh, so, you know, Wind River or somebody, you know, some of these OSVs are indeed going to have um, package feeds and, and other things like that available. So, so there's a different, once you go to the commercial side where it's, you're paying for the licensing and everything, they have gone to that extra hurdle to do the legal stuff. So, that, so there's, the, there's just a difference there. So just speaking from some limited experience, you can certainly use Yocto to build, you know, the root file system and then Docker file, you can build a Docker image with just a root file system and no need to run additional steps to populate any additional packages or configurations. So there is no need to also have a package manager in the, the Docker image. 
Um, that Resin.io is um, one company who does some work in this space and they generate Docker images in their build system, which is based on Yocto. Um, although I'm personally also curious about the work being done in core for this um, generation of these images. Um, there's some other challenges, for example, um, configuring services inside of a container. Um, and uh, so there's a variety of other interesting topics that come from generating container images in um, the Yocto build system. So that sounds like some great ideas to put into the wish list for future releases. Um, and, and I'm not exactly, so I know we, we, it was a couple of releases ago, so it's about a year ago that we got um, the basic container image stuff in there. Um, but I, we definitely did not go a lot further with, with the, the container image class. Um, so that, that's certainly a spot that could be interesting now. Um, and also, you know, I think the world has changed in that direction a lot more than it was even a year ago. So it's, it's an interesting concept um, to, to think about adding more support for that. But we do have a lot of challenges with, um, with, with what we can support and what we can add. So, um, you know, we just have to figure out what the priorities are and things like that. Are you ready? Okay. Oh, oops. Training. Training? Oh yes, uh, so Linux Foundation has training. We have a boatload of training sources there. If anybody else is putting on training, send us a note and we'll get your stuff listed on the website as well. And you know, a big part of that, we have the Linux Foundation classes uh, listed there, so, and a map of where around the world these things are as well. And a map of consultants that also offer training. So, the new website has a, a lot of new features, so keep digging. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, a topic. Yeah, right. Oh, one more question, I'm sorry. Any plans to support the Octo build on Windows 10 with the Ubuntu subsystem? I think it's an interesting idea. Well, I mean, I don't think we've got plans. It's, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay. All right, well, this is a, uh, a demonstration from Fujitsu. Okay. We, we developed package management for Yocto project, and now, we port it to DNF. This is Yocto project binaries for RPMs. At first, run environment setup script and we added DNF. Oh. We added DNF script for package management. And at first, in it, Next, launch text UI and select packages, install call, 
and install dev packages. It's selectable. It installed for root FS and this option makes source archives and this option makes SPDX archives. This is installed result. That's all. This package manager is opened in GitHub. Please get or join develop with us. Thank you.